I would hope the bankruptcy courts would have the same respect of the trial courts that I have the bankruptcy court, right? I don't know if 41 is moved. I think we need to understand a little bit what we're going to do here, Your Honor. Um, and so let's go to 41. Okay. So 41, this is our motion. Well, you know, before we get to that, maybe Mr. Adu ought to, there are a couple other things that we moved to that may affect uh, this 41. That's right. So, for example, we filed a motion for reconsideration, a motion for some of the number five alteration, and we still have pending real large motion in limiting number nine. And I think both of those are going to be moved now after Mr. Dew tells you what he told us this morning. Okay. Tell me, what did you tell me? Did you tell me about a uh, seven? The media one? Oh, the media one. Your Honor, there, there was an offer this morning for a stipulation. If we don't get a stipulation, real water will not be contesting uh, liability or medical causation. In this case, we're only going to argue for the jury reasonable damages. If we get a stipulation, we'll, we'll memorialize that. Um, right. That will be our position. At My only problem with stipulating to that is every time I agree to anything that involves real water, the bankruptcy trustee and his attorney claim that I violated the bankruptcy <laughs> state. So I, this may be a distinction without a difference, but it keeps me out of being a target. And so I would think that the better approach for these purposes would be that that Mr. Liu says that they're going to admit liability and admit causation. The court accepts that admission as opposed to me agreeing to it and being, you know, subject to a potential motion from the bankruptcy trustee. So, Your Honor, well, well I, I try to stay away from the bankruptcy court and trustees also. I, I, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, maybe we'll address this in our pretrial memorandum. We were going to. Uh, File an independent one if that's okay with the court. There's going to be a joint one. We had a meet and confer this morning. How, how about this though? And and um, I mean, this is kind of a, this truly can impact scheduling, and that's yes. kind of how I that's how I'm looking at it. And um, if there's this still do you think what, you do whatever is right? But if you want, because when do they come back? So you'll be here tomorrow. We will. Yes. Okay, and, and what you can do, maybe you can talk about. Yeah, we talked about your. I'm just. No, I understand your concern. Your concern. There's no is, way to get the bankruptcy court to agree to anything because they're adverse to our positions now. They're trying to help us out supposedly, but they're not. Um, so that's why I really get concerned about stipulating because in one of the bankruptcy filings, the trustee took the position. Uh, I wish I would have brought it, but. The, the, the trustee took the position that I was doing something with regards to, I can't remember what it was. I thought it was pretty innocuous. I mean, it's potentially violating the stay. And I'm thinking, what, what are you talking about? Well, my instincts were correct as far as how to interpret that order then. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't want to sound like I'm gun shy, but I'm gun shy. Yeah, I haven't seen anything like that, um, nor am I part of those proceedings. But certainly I'm happy to talk to Mr. Kemp. After court today, so we don't take any more of the court's time on this issue. Um, I did also want to raise a slightly different issue. No, go ahead. Which is just that um, there still is one remaining uh, third party complaint. It's against Rural Water Gold Coast by UNFW. I just wanted to alert the court to that, that um, there could be a need for a phase three or however we do it. But um, I and and, I, and as far as phases are concerned, we do what we have to do. I'm not concerned about that. If there's indemnity claims or contribution claims or all those things, we'll handle that just like we handle day-to-day -day routinely in construction. Exactly, Your Honor. I just wanted yeah. to make sure the court was aware yeah. there's an issue. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Tell me this. Do you need a little – you need for me to step down for a little bit and you want to talk? No, Your Honor. We, we were still digesting it. Uh, okay. You know, we, We've gone through our witness list once and tried to. I want to. I mean, when, anytime you're talking about resolving key issues in a case, I want to give you whatever time you need. No, I think, I think <laughs> I don't mind um, but but we do. I, we I you know our first blush is that this is significantly going to reduce the trial time because we're probably going to uh, eliminate a couple of people. Well, quite a few people. Oh yeah. <laughs> and your honor, we'll have to consider how it might affect us. I mean, joint several and issues like that. 
I expect we'll come to the court with a proposed limiting instruction. Well, yeah, so just agree to the same thing he agreed to. That's <laughs> an option, Mr. <laughs> Kemp. I will, I will advise the client they can consider it. But, thank you. <laughs> so where do we go from here? Judge, we, we I uh, wasn't expecting the, the most serious number, right the now. most, the largest number of motions remaining are the Hannah motions. So we have Hannah motion eliminate six. Uh, I think we have more than that. Does no, it's no, no, six. We just started with six. We have six, seven, seven. We we're going to submit on the briefs. I didn't eight. know that. Yeah, eight, ten. No, hold on, hold on. Right. We said we would submit it. We were fine with us. Oh, not, we said we would submit it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. He didn't say that. So, okay. no, but yeah, no one's advised me on some of this stuff yet. Will, no, so. no worries. Okay. So how did this start? Why don't you start with whatever one you want to start with, and we'll get started. So, hand on motion. Let me, let me, let me help you on some of these, then we can get going. Okay. okay. Interesting. Your Honor, with regard to our motions eliminating, not our dispositive motions, which have not yet been heard. I understand, sir. I we guess have, we have some. Okay. Yes, sir. But I think we're 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 getting down to that. We're it. All right. So another, this should this should be done. I will help the plaintiffs in the court understand where I see them. <clears throat> With regard to motion in limine numbers three and four. I have those on my list. Your motion in sure. You oh, you know what? And Troy doesn't have an answer on number, motion to let me number 41. Is that correct? That's yeah, we thought it was moved, Sean. Well, Your Honor, I think uh, the court, uh, yeah, the court the court has pretty much eliminated real water of Tennessee from the first two phases. So no matter what happens, I think they're out of the first two phases. But that's where it's either, right? You're not an active participant. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be an active participant, but I'm going to absorb. Not saying you can sit here and observe. No, I, I don't Mr. Kavanaugh, I do realize really sometimes it's hard to leave. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm, <trying> to, <laughs> I'm going to try to digest what I'm doing, if anything. So the, the motion is suspended. I guess 41. Yeah. We're gonna pass on forty one and think about it overnight, your own case guy. And so I just want to make sure for the for clarification for the record and for Tory's benefit, we're gonna pass on motion on um thirty forty one. Forty one. Plaintiff's forty one. Plaintiff's forty one. Until tomorrow. So we'll, bring, we'll 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 discuss that tomorrow. Let's keep that on the list, but we're not going to resolve that right now. Yes. Why don't you do that, Scott? Scott, didn't we want to wait on Rich till after the summer judgment? Yes, I did, but he then said no. Let's sure. uh, whatever. No, 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 no. Do the summer judgment. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, whatever you want to do. That part I can agree with. There are <laughs> nothing. So what, which one are we handling now, sir? Like the court's indulgence on this, I have a motion in limine to dismiss punitive damages. Okay. Okay. If we and this that, is a, this is as to your client. It's as to my client. Yes. And that's uh, which number is that? My. Oh, you know that's a great question. Uh, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And, and, and from this perspective, I don't know what impact this has on the concerns with the bankruptcy trustee, but if you agree and I enter the order, what are you going to do? Maybe I could not oppose his. But you understand where I'm going. I'm mean, just trying to make it easier. If you want to move this case forward, there's ways. But I would hope, you know, just as it's really important to understand this, I would hope the bankruptcy courts would have the same respect of the trial courts 
that I have the bankruptcy court, right? For example, if it's not a bankruptcy court issue, I'm... I think the bankruptcy court has the same staff. I think the bankruptcy trustee the bankruptcy attorney <laughs> might have a different view. Okay, I understand. When you hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. <laughs> okay, so, where are we at, sir? Do you need the number for it? This motion will be number one. It's, it's, it's not. It's motion for summary judgment. 547. 547, I've been told. Thank you. All right, sir. Your Honor, I understand that the court is very familiar with punitive damages <coughs> and to uh, look into those. The court has also been made aware by previous argument that I've provided to the court what exactly it is that Hannah Instruments did with regard to this, to this lawsuit. My client was responsible for selling an ORP meter to Milwaukee. So what does that mean? My client Never went to the real water facility, never talked to anyone at the real water. None of my employees ever went there. Don't know them, don't know what they were using it for, don't know if it was going to read negative, don't know if it was going to read positive. Earlier, Your Honor, I showed you a chart of all the different kinds of water. Some of them were positive, some of them were negative. So we, we don't know. And, and by the way, our meter can read both. All right, so if you can, on my motion, we'll go through this very quickly. Just some of the important parts of um, the motion. We're looking at page nine of the motion, Your Honor. Right. Okay. 2020, looking at line 12. As we know, Real Water was part of its facilities to Henderson. They hired a person by the name of Casey Akins, a high school graduate, not trained in the use of ORP meters. Prior's employment, never received it. In his first week of being an employee, he then gets an ORP meter. So, and he's working with it, having never spoken to anyone at Hannah, never spoken to anyone at Milwaukee. Okay? Real Water made a toxic batch of water, which they believed poisoned, um, which, which the plaintiffs believed poisoned five of the plaintiffs. Complaint, complaint alleges that at some point the real water employee used the ORP meter and received a reading which was not within real water's parameters. So that's the first problem. It's we're not telling anyone who uses an ORP meter, hey, use these parameters. You decide what we tell you to do as far as what you want to read. We're just going to give you a meter, you read with it. So there's there's no you know the, the rulings of punitives. I've got to have something with, ma with malice, something fraudulent, something like that. And this has to be hinged on some sort of a, an instrument that we didn't, we failed to warn that it didn't do something. And in this case, I believe the plaintiffs are going to suggest and have been suggesting that it's inaccurate when conditioned or it's inaccurate if it's not conditioned. Either way, there still has to be some sort of a malice by Hannah, who just sold an ORP meter to Milwaukee. That's it. That's our action. When Casey Aitchin took a reading, it got a measurement below negative 225. When we mean below, it, we think it was like negative 130. So it's closer to zero than it is to negative 225. He didn't call Blaine Jones. What should I do? So he didn't call Hannah and he didn't call Milwaukee. He called his boss. We've seen the video of Blaine Jones. Shows he knows exactly how to condition these things. Shows he knows how to add concentrate, add whatever he wants to do with it. And, he, and we know that he knows how to use the ORP meter because we watched him use the ORP meter and it gave a reading. Okay? Then he says, and so he told you to add more concentrate. That's on page 10, line 15. Answer correct. So 
Casey was told by his boss to do something. This is not the actions of Hannah. Hey, let me call them and see what they would do in this circumstance. How would you correct this issue? I wasn't done. So he added some more. This is page 11. Yeah, I figured that would be the... I figured. Not, not Hannah told me, or my boss said, when, I, when this head comes up, I talk to Hannah or I talk to Milwaukee. None of that happened. That would, I figured that would be the least amount to make it change to what I needed it to change to. Not what anyone else did. This, this is all um, some sort of a uh, event, right? Superseding, intervening act by Mr. Aiken of what he wants to do. So punitive damages wise, when someone does something like this, we're not held liable punitively for their actions. That is the cause of the fact that, according to Mr. Kemp's clients, they got m double the amount of hydrazine. Now, we've already gone through this, Your Honor, so I'm not going to belabor it. We're not going to be going through this and saying, oh, yeah, and by the way, Hannah's ORP meter reads chemicals. It does not. We've already gone through that. You've already ruled on that. No, it does not. And it doesn't tell you, oh, by the way, if it has this negative reading, that's bad. It, it, it doesn't. It's not a safety device. It's just a measuring device. It either tells you up or down, crossway, sideways, what is the measurement. That's all it can do. It can't tell you anything more. In order to bring their case, they have to show that it was inaccurate. Okay? That gets down to where we get to Mr. Mike Motley on page 12. He's the, he is their expert. Looking at line 8 on page 12. What scientific certainty are you able to provide in this case? What science background do you have? I'm a social scientist. Very similar to the field of psychology. Thank you. So your scientific certainty is limited to the social science. Is that a fair statement? Yes. All right. So whether or not it's accurate or not cannot be determined by Mr. Motley. Okay. Do you have any background in chemistry? You don't. No. You have background in biology. That's true. I don't. You have no background in medicine. That's correct. You have no background in engineering. That's true as well. So Mr. Motley is going to get up there and say what? That the instructions are bad when he, and there's another motion that the plaintiffs, I guess, have not heard and decided not to hear, which is they don't have to tell me and they don't have to tell you and that's not fatal to their case if Motley doesn't tell you what instructions should be done, because he can't. In other words, if these, are, these instructions are bad. Okay, why are they bad? Well, I can't tell you that, but they are because somebody got hurt. Well, what instructions do we need to induce? I can't do that. I'm not able to. Then I asked him, have you ever used an ORP meter? The answer is no. I asked him, this is because it's right in the warning. Here's our warning. Make sure you use safe laboratory practices. Does that mean anything to you? Not specifically, no. Um, have you been in, into a laboratory? Last time he says that was uh, high school. Um, I understand he was born in 1945. If I'm doing the math correctly, that's like 1963 when he graduated from high school. I don't believe ORP technology was even around until the 70s. That's at the end of page, that's on page 14, lines 11 and 12. I've already gone through what Mr. Silvaggio has said in his deposition about what the, the MW500 goes through. It's on page 16. Um, I told you what it does at the top of page 17. It is sold by Hannah to Milwaukee. That's all they do. They just sell it. Remember, this is punitive damages. We should be punitively liable for selling a product to Milwaukee. Just so you know, Milwaukee then adds instructions after we get we sell it to Milwaukee. Okay. Now the plaintiff may say, "Yeah, but Mr. Uh, Salvaggio is the president." Well, this is before that. 
This tip card was was created by someone else at Milwaukee, a guy named Brian Moore. We already have been told, at least I've already told the court that he passed away. That's not disputed. What is in dispute, I guess, is whether or not it can be read out of the box. But we'll have people here that will testify with regard to that. They didn't go, and we, we talked about it the other day when you uh, looked at the motion and granted it for them, that there's a difference between conga and water. You then made a ruling that uh, in order to do testing, it has to be substantially similar. And what I mean by the testing solution is it has to be duplicative. So because we didn't have the titanium tubes, that was not sufficient. It was duplicative, and therefore that motion was granted. So putting that in mind of what we've got here, um, uh, we went through it, and, and all that he said is, with regard to all of the testimony that Mr. Brown gave, okay, talked about the Congen water, this is on page 20, he says, who do you order the ORP meters from? Hannah, and that would be, be Hannah in Rhode Island, correct. Other than that, and I didn't take his deposition, this is Mr. Kemp that took the deposition, that is the full extent of all that we did. And now they want a punitive claim for selling a meter we get into the standards, 42005, this is page 21. We've given you the case law up there on summary judgment. What does fraud mean? I don't think they're going after fraud, that we, it was fraudulent. Oppression, fraud, malice, expressed or implied. There's no malice that I can see here. We're guilty of oppression. Maybe it is fraud that they're going after. Was it intentional? I don't think that's what they're saying. Mouse misconduct, which is intended, we put that all together here. I don't see that Hannah selling this could be there. But, Your Honor, you're not asking me. You're, you're, you're supposed to tell me, is there something that I'm missing on this one that I haven't explained well enough to, to, to give you what needs to be done? The rest of it's pretty straightforward. Well, I, th I think that the rest and focus is on the adequacy of the warnings and whether there's a conscious disregard. Right. And, and, and they cite the Wyeth case, I think, yep. as the, for the proposition. And I guess they're following the lead of Justice Cherry and decisions he made. That's kind of how I read it. I see. So under why, what, what are we looking at then is that the, the instructions that were provided with regard to the conditioning of this particular probe for negative readings was inserted by Milwaukee. So there's no conscious disregard for uh, something that wasn't ever put into the packaging by Hannah. But is that really the analysis? Because remember okay. this. No, no, I'm just, I, I, and, and I think this is important. There's, there's a couple issues there. Okay. But we can't overlook the fact that at the end of the day, when it comes to um, strict product liability, the thrust and focus is on the product itself, right? Okay. Manufacturing. Uh, defects, uh, design defects, and here we are in, into the warning area. And so whether your client put the warning in or not, that's not really the issue. The issue is the adequacy of the warning and whether uh, based upon current Nevada case law and also Chapter 42, um, whether or not there's sufficient evidence to go to the jury as to a punitive damage claim. And I'm just summarizing it. That's kind of how I see it. Okay. And so I think the thrust and focus should be on <coughs> Wyeth and... All right. Because that's a labeling case. Read, Your Honor. Okay. So if it's... That's okay. just kind of how I see it. I mean, I, I, but I want to hear what you have to say about it. <coughs> so then you have to say under Wyeth, did, as you said, that we just... Unconscious disregard for something that we never labeled. Labeling it was done somewhere else by the manufacturer and the designer of this product. It came to us in plastic. We didn't un we didn't undo it. We just took it from there to there. And you say, well, then how are we punitively liable for the work of others? In other words, the conscious disregard of those labels. And under Wyeth, it has to be I. I did those labels. I made those instructions. I, my, my client did that, and we knew that it was going to hurt the consumer, the end user, in this case, the plaintiffs. Remember, the ORP meters, the, the ORP read water, and that water never went to the consumers. 
So if they never drank the water that was tested or measured by the ORP meter, then that's could never hurt them. There was no water that was ever touched by the ORP meter. Okay? So where was the conscious disregard and the instructions that were given since there was no work done by and it, it then becomes, well, what was our conscious thing when the instructions for this are inside the packaging? The warnings are on the outside label, and the tip card is put in by Milwaukee after the fact, when we're not there. So we have nothing to do with that. How can we consciously disregard things we've never drafted, never revised, never did any of these things? And that's what we're saying. And, and I want to make sure I'm clear as you are you discussing the chain of distribution, right? Um, but that's for strict product liability. I get that part. I'm talking about punitively. I have to be. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm trying to make sure I understand what's going on from right. a di distribution perspective. You're saying, look, Judge, we didn't put the label in. We didn't. So, uh, and you say, I understand the, the strict product liability component. I mean, it is. Yeah, yeah, I got that. So, so explain to me what happened from a mechanical perspective. How the label got in? Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I'm all I'm asking. All right. What happened? <laughs> Early on, as Mr. Kemp would, would like to tell you, 35 years ago, instructions were made. I understand that. That's clear Lisbon, from the. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's in Lisbon, Portugal. Okay, by a different company. That. Those, then after that, revisions are done in Italy with English speakers, okay? And it remains there, okay? It remains there, okay? Revisions are done there. And we've had revisions on the instructions all the way up until March of 2021. And that's where all the instructions are done. They are not under control. They are not voiced upon. No grammar is reviewed. No one at Hannah Instruments <coughs> looks at any of the instructions or the labeling or anything with regard to Milwaukee's MW500 ORP meter. Okay? So we were not we're not in that conscious place of it. So then it goes to Italy and okay, the I got production of it moves from Italy, by the way, just to Romania. The Romanians who manufacture. I, I, I don't mind telling this. I'm trying to follow you. So I got Portugal. Right. Then it goes to Italy. It goes to, and, and we're manufacturing there. This is back in 1980s. Not relevant. In other words, no meter from the 1980s is at issue in this case. Is that a fair statement? All right. So then let's get to the, the 2010s at least. At least we're somewhere in the same decade. Okay. All right. The, the manufacturing is done in Romania. Okay. As part of that, the probe itself was actually manufactured, and I told you this, in Mauritius, which is an island nation off the coast of Madagascar. Okay? Had it, strike that, dosing pump units, which is the entity that manufactures, assembles the meter. Okay? That's in Romania. That's the name of the company, dosing pump. SRL to be specific. Okay? So I want to make sure. So how do we get from a Romania to Madagascar? Madagascar makes a probe. Okay. So there's two parts. Remember I showed you the two, two parts? There's the black part that's the meter that has the LCD board. Then there's the probe that you stick into the water. Two different parts. So the probe comes from Madagascar and the um, meter's made in Romania. And where do the product inserts and the uh, design, packaging design, what does that happen? That happens in Romania. Okay. Packaging and instructions. Instructions were made in Italy. Okay. It's just about the packaging. Packaging is made in Romania. Yes, this is what happens when we have like a global economy, right? And they buy 
certain parts here, certain parts there. Okay. So the meter itself is assembled. The actual meter is assembled uh, in Romania made by a country called Dosing Pump. Okay. Anakin Smith's SRL, they do the uh, they do the packaging. In other words, they just put it in the packaging, and the people that do the writing on the packaging are in Italy. Okay. So, I just want to make sure I'm clear. I guess, it, the, is this safe to say the final manufacturing of the product as far as packaging, inserts, and so on would be Romania? Except for one exception, the answer is all that is done in Romania, yes. Okay. And I'll get to that. All right, I'm listening, sir. Okay. Then that package is put into plastic and shipped to the United States, where it arrives at Hannah Instruments, Inc., a Rhode Island corporation. Okay? So we're going out of Romania to there, and it arrives. We get a purchase order from Milwaukee. It says, ship us 50 meters. We want to pay for them as a purchase order. We give them a price, they pay that price, they get shipped to them. He gets shipped to them not, not out of the packaging. Nothing is altered by Hannah Instruments Inc. in Rhode Island. Nothing is changed. Okay? When it arrives there in North Carolina, that's where Milwaukee Instruments is. Not to be confused with Milwaukee Tools, for instance, because uh, that's a, actually a pretty good tool maker. I wish I could load for Yes, that's not what we're talking about. I understand. Okay. They then open up the package. And this is Milwaukee Instruments. Milwaukee Instruments. And they put in a tip card. Let's okay. do with Congen water machines. There's machines right in the, in the stuff. They slip that in, seal it back up, and they send them to whoever their customers are. They're the retailer. Okay. Okay. So it goes from... Romania, then it goes to Hannah in, in uh, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and then they do what they do, and then it goes to, I guess, the ultimate retailer would be Milwaukee Instruments, and Milwaukee puts the zip, the zip card in? Yes. Sir. Okay. That's the chain of distribution. And I'm not talking about strict product liability here, I'm talking about what did Hannah Instruments Inc. do, consciously disregarded everybody as far as the instructions and stuff like that? That entity in Italy, not here, not named, not a part of this lawsuit. Okay? I understand. Hannah Instruments SRL, a Romanian company, is named in other lawsuits. My understanding is that many of them, they have now been dismissed. For other reasons, I'll leave it at that. The plaintiff can tell you why. They're, they're not, they're at least four or five of them. They still may be in another one that's actually being um, worked on by Mr. Eglitz's firm, but I think they're in the process of dismissing Romanian companies as well. I'm not sure that concerns here, but the Romanian companies are getting out. The Mauritius company that made the probe has not been named in anything. The uh, maker of the uh, Instructions, the labeling, all that in Italy has never been in Italy. The parent company of all those companies is an entity known as SID US. And when you say the parent company of all those companies, which, which one? Romanian, Italian, Portuguese, and Mauritius. So everything across the pond, I'm going to use that, is SID US. company of Hannah is SID International. Okay. So that would include that parent company is the owner of Hannah Instruments Inc., the Rhode Island Corporation, and Milwaukee Instruments, a North Carolina Corporation. Okay. So understand all that Hannah does is 
is they make a purchase of Milwaukee instruments from Hannah SRL with all the labeling that's done over there. Here, we'd like to buy 15 of your meters. Okay, we'll send them to you. We buy them. Then Milwaukee turns around and says, we'd like to buy 15 of your meters. Okay, here's a price. We sell them to them. This is punitive damages that we're now talking about. Not strict product liability. Did we have anything to do with the labeling? No. Did we have anything to do with the tip card? No. Okay? Do we have anything to do with the instructions? No. Hannah merely passes it on. Okay? Let me give you the last part because I think it's where maybe the plaintiff will go on this. Probably not, though. There's a, there is an employee of Milwaukee and Hannah who has the same person. The president of Milwaukee is a VP of operations at Hannah. Okay? He does not, he did not control the tip card. He does not ever speak to, there is no evidence of him ever speaking to real water. Okay. He is not the person that authorizes the instructions, the labeling, the tip card, any of that. His name is Carl Salvaggio. He doesn't do any of this. Okay, He's just making sure that the operations, moving Milwaukee parts, is done by someone to make sure it goes from one place to the next. Okay, He reviews the sales data. That's about it. Okay, He's not a chemist. Okay. He has a lot of years of experience in this, but that's all that he does. And under Wyatt, I've got to, sh the plaintiffs have to show, hey, Anna Instruments, Inc. knew that these instructions were bad and let them go forward anyways. Anna Instruments, Inc. has never been sued before. They have never had notice that their instructions are bad, according to what the plaintiffs believe. So there's no notice there that we've got something on there. We've never had a customer complain to Hannah about anything to do with Milwaukee Instruments during the time that this lawsuit has been there. In other words, in September, October 2020, uh, and beforehand where they're saying this or that, okay, that isn't being handled where it's amounted to we can't resolve, but here, here's a new probe. Something like that. No one is saying that I got sick because someone gave me hydrogen that emitted from <laughs> this instrument. Okay, because that's clearly what it does not do. Okay? So under YF, on labeling, I can't see how Hannah can be involved for punitives. Okay? Punitive damages. I'm not talking about strict product liability, Your Honor. I don't want to have those two mixed and mingled. No, no, no. I understand what you're talking about. I understand the distinction. I do. Okay. I do. I get it. Okay. And so we would have to be somewhere in there that where there are actions taken where someone goes to us and there would have to be evidence that would be proper that says, Mr. Savadra, his deposition was taken. Did you, were you ever asked to review these instructions? The answer to that's no. Were you ever to, to ask to look over the labeling? The answer is no. Were you ever asked to look over this tip card? No. So he's not, he's not in the mix. Was anyone at Hannah? No. I think I'm done there. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, the fundamental proposition in advanced is that a conglomerate, which is composed of all these companies that have been mentioned, SRL, Do S S or, excuse me, Dosi Clums, owned by either Hannah Romania or Hannah something else. Uh, the Italian entity is owned by one of the Hannah entities. Uh, Milwaukee and uh, Hannah are both owned by... Uh, one of these STD entities, it's a big conglomerate. So 
Is it, is it, I keep saying that. What is it? Should, what, let's not have it on the record, please. S-I-D. That's what I thought. Can, you, can I have that stricken? You did not mean to say that, right? No. Okay. What's right? I was thinking of Mr. Bautista's motion. Okay. All right. So the fundamental proposition being advanced here is you can have a conglomerate that has 110 different entities, and you can shirk your warning obligation by having company A in the conglomerate, conglomerate sell the product, and company Z in the conglomerate draft the warning. That's the fundamental proposition here. And where it fails at the outset is when you sell or distribute a product, you have the obligation under Nevada law to provide the warning. You have it as the seller. You can't sit there and say, oh, it's not me, it's my Siamese sister that drafted the uh, user manual. So that proposition just doesn't fly, Your Honor. So when we trace this down, um, we find that the same user manual has been used for 35 years. Okay, there's been some aesthetic changes. We've gone over this before. But they use the same user manual. And what Mr. Uh, uh, I think his name is Dupree, Dupree, he was, or excuse me, Adrian Petraeus, Petrine, Adrian Petrine, I'm having some time you're talking about. Yeah, uh, he is the uh, general manager over in Romania. And so what he told us happened here is that when they first started making this meter, that someone came up with some sort of design spec. And the design spec is both for the meter and for the user manual. So 35 years ago, whether it was in Italy or not, I don't know. I don't think that was clear from the uh, uh, discovery. But wherever it was, 35 years ago, and it's probably the Italian founder of the company, but someone drafted this user manual. Okay? Uh, all we know for sure is that it was someone in this Hanna conglomerate. We don't know whether it was Hanna, Romania, whatever. But so they kept using this same user manual for 35 years. Uh, the only change that was made is finally they, they had so many inquiries about this oxidization, calibration, how do we make this meter work to measure negatives, they started adding this tip card in. That was a change that was made. But the user manual, where the warning should be, was never changed in 35 years. So our argument on punitive damages is pretty simple. First of all, I mean, using the exact same user manual for 35 years, uh, I, that's just unheard of. But more importantly, as Your Honor pointed to, uh, we're relying upon the Wyeth case. Uh, can I have uh, my opposition, uh, Chris, up on page page uh, page okay, on? page four so why it you, you know I, I don't know why I always forget about this case because it's very eloquent when we written by Judge Jerry and it uh, does establish an important point so here's what happened in Wyatt which was a, a breast implant case so Wyatt more specifically Wyatt's European division uh, is doing some sort of study, and they find out a new danger with regard to the uh, breast implant. Okay, so they immediately change the European warning label. The exact same product is sold in the United States, and they didn't update it. So Justice Cherry writes, as a result of the European study, Wyeth updated its European warnings, but never updated its United States labels. And the United States labels were relevant to the user in this case because these were written up there in, in Reno that filed suit against uh, 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 the manufacturer. So based on the warnings, language, and last actions, we conclude that a jury could reasonably determine that while Wyatt warned of breast cancer, it also tried to hide any potential harmful consequences of its product. And in that case, there was a... Uh, I think it was a specific form of breast cancer that they had some more information. Uh, women were particularly susceptible to a problem. They didn't add that to the label in the United States. They did in Europe. <laughs> so Justice Cherry writes that this is evidence that supports a conclusion that Wyatt acted with, not, with malice when it had knowledge of the probable consequences of its wrongful acts. And the wrongful acts in this case were they knew, they knew the danger, they warned about it in Europe, 
that they did not update the label here in the United States. So our position is pretty simple. Can we go to the top, Chris? Uh, the bottom, I'm sorry. This is the warning, portion of the warning that they gave with the conditioning probe. And again, the conditioning probe, uh, excuse me, the conditioning solution. The conditioning solution was discontinued in 2017. It's not really clear from the evidence, I think, when it started, but we're guessing sometime in 2013, 14 times. <coughs> they warned that, quote, to effectively read a negative warp state of water, the platinum probe used in most warp meters must be in a natural condition, which is oxidized. If they warn of the danger in, in this particular, uh, with, the, with the conditioning solution, and the reason they warn of the danger is they're trying to sell the conditioning solution. So they're telling people, oh, here's a problem. You've got to oxidize the probe, buy our conditioning kit to do it. Then when they discontinued the conditioning kit in 2017, they didn't do anything. They didn't provide warning of the exact same problem they warned about in the conditioning <coughs> uh, instructions. They, they didn't uh, provide an alternative solution to use. They didn't change the uh, uh, user manual to, to either say this or to emphasize that you should condition the broken sugar <coughs> for five days. They didn't do anything. So this falls squarely within Justice Cherry's uh, admonition. Because they knew the exact problem. They had it in a instruction kit for the conditioning solution that they put out sometime in the 2014 through 2017 time frame. But they never changed the meter, the, the user manual. They, they, they probably should have done it at the same time they did this conditioning uh, solution language. But especially after they discontinued the conditioning solution in 2017, they provided no warning whatsoever. Uh, and so that's why we think... So I just want to make sure I'm clear. They stopped selling or marketing or um, including the conditioning solution. Um, the, the conditioning solution was actually... Separate. So here's what happened, Your Honor. When we're selling the meter for decades and relying upon you conditioning it using vinegar, then they... It says right here, uh, well, it doesn't say this one, but it says another warning from the uh, condition solution, that they think that when you use vinegar, it provides inconsistent results, especially with negative ore. So you can cure this problem by using the conditioning solution. So they developed the conditioning solution, and I, I would also point out that there's a number of manufacturers that have conditioning solutions that they sell their products, like the American Marine product, uh, Mr. Rasmussen, had up the other day, the, that's the pinpoint meter. They, they provide conditioning solution with a the kit. These people tried to sell a conditioning solution as an add-on, more money, okay? Doesn't come with, they we're just throwing it in there with the MW500. They were selling it as an additional product. So when, to sell that, they, they specifically identify the danger. They get this warning, and they're doing that because they're trying to promote sales of conditioning solutions. But then they discontinued the conditioning solution sales. And again, the reason it was discontinued in 2017 was because somehow or another they found it caused cancer. Okay, Judge cancer. And well, that's the testimony in the record. That no, it, the, European, the European Union said that it had a cancer causing agent, they discontinued it. It's going to object. What? It's making my objection because that's not true. I'll move on. Uh, if you want me to submit the testimony, I will. But in any event, they discontinued in 2017, and they don't provide an alternative solution to the problem. They go back to the vinegar. And at that point in time, they don't tell people. They've never told people how, how many days it takes to put it in vinegar, the five days. They don't have that in the instructions. But the, the reason we think we fall squarely within the Wyatt case is because they have the exact language we contend should be used, this language, and they're not using it when they discontinue the conditioning solution. They never change the user manual to add on it. And, you know, Mr. Rasmussen says, oh, Judge, you know, these products, we couldn't change the user manual. Well, 
You know, all of a sudden it goes from a white meter to a black meter. All of a sudden the box goes from a white box to a black box. You know, these things aren't falling down from heaven or washing up on the shores of uh, Moriatis uh, or some other place. These are manufactured by this company. So to suggest, to suggest that they had no input whatsoever into the user manual, that's an admission of liability because you have an obligation to make sure you are providing a warning of, uh, uh, to give a, and I think the language in CRA is to give a fair indication of potential hazards with the product. That's your obligation under Nevada law. So for him to say, oh, I couldn't do it because it was one of our subsidiaries that printed up the user manual. That, that's just not a valid argument, Your Honor. And if anything, like I said, it's an admission of liability. But back to Justice Cherry, again, the bottom of Wyeth here. Exact same thing. Exact same thing. It's even a case where the, uh, uh, the European entity is the one that updated the label, and the United States entity did nothing. That's the situation that uh, uh, Mr. Rasmussen, Mr. Rasmussen is hypothesizing occurred, occurred here. The United States entity did nothing. So that's our argument, Your Honor. The final argument we make uh, pertains to the countrywide case. Can we have the next page? This is the third reason we think there should be punitives. The first reason was they didn't update the user manual. The second reason was they had the exact same warning for another product and applied in this case. And the third one. They knew that if you did not ax oxidize the meter property, it could affect water quality. And the reason we know they knew that, go, go down one more crystal. This is from their product literature, okay? Orc testing is important for water quality. That's their statement. They knew that, that there was this potential problem, water quality, uh, if you didn't oxidize the probe properly. And, and again, they're promoting this probe as being, being the answer to this problem, saying that it's a good product for water quality. Obviously, they knew the consequences of not conditioning the probe correctly. The consequence is that it would not allow an accurate reading, an inconsistent reading, that would affect water quality. So when you look at the countrywide case, countrywide basically says that if, if the manufacturer, quote, has knowledge of the probable harmful consequences of a wrongful act and a willful different, different, uh, deliberate failure to act to avoid those consequences, it can be held liable for punitive damages. They knew the possible consequences, poor water quality. They didn't do anything. Mr. Rasmussen submitted that. They made no change whatsoever. Didn't even try to make a change. That, that's what I think is, is really astounding here. You know, I ask all these witnesses, well, what did you do to try to change the warning? They didn't even try. Um, so for those reasons, Your Honor, any one of the three reasons, but especially the fact that they had the exact same warning we're contending should have been in the user manual, especially because of Roweth versus, uh, excuse me, White, Roweth versus Wyeth or Wyeth versus Roweth, uh, especially because of Justice Cherry's reasoning, we think this motion should be denied. I'll try to be brief, Your Honor, because um, there's just some things that weren't said right. Could you pull that one photograph that I just showed you? Do you remember that video, Your Honor, of, of Blaine Jones, where he, he oxidized the, uh, the the probe on a video? Yes, I do. Okay. With that in mind, this is that solution right here. Okay. Where did we find this oxidation solution? Bottles one and two. This was at the Henderson facility when we found it in 2023, that Blaine Jones uses to oxidize these probes. And here's the instructions that he reviews and talks about reviewing them. And he says, this is what you do. This is as late as what, 2017? He's got these. He has these instructions. He's doing this. 
He's oxidized them with these things. So to suggest that he doesn't have them and he's not using it, when we see in the video he actually is using these and does this, flies in the face of that. This is in the instructions. This is with real water. And this is being used by real water when we find it in 2023, which means in 2021 when they're, they've stopped, ceased operations real water, they still have this. So we'll push out as you see. They've got plenty. They're, it's full. There's, remember, it's reusable. It says it right there in the instructions. Save the solution for additional applications later. They can continue to use this. They have it. They're using it to oxidize the probes. So to suggest that we didn't update this is wrong. Let me get to the next one. It's pretty simple. I, I don't know where they get off on saying the instructions weren't updated for 35 years. That's just flat out wrong. On the back of the instructions, on the black one that I have over there, all of these instruction manuals, are revised every so often. The latest one I have is that it's revised as of March of 2021. March of 2021, the instructions on how to use these probes and how to use these meters is updated. It's not 35 years old. All I'm telling you is that we don't have the, we don't make the final decision on whether or not to change them. But the English right here, this, has a date on it of March of 2021. It's not a 35-year-old thing. Part of the reason I know that that's true is because it gives you references to something that you don't want in this in evidence. That is, it puts down the MilwaukeeInstruments.com website. It puts down the Milwaukee Instruments website for Europe as well. Both of those, both of those are there. It also gives certifications, which all, all the directors of Europe are. Those don't happen until the 2010s because that's when the European Union started to recognize these things as the directives that are used. This is being updated constantly. It's just not that Hammond Instruments, Inc. and Rhode Island Corporation is the one that's doing it. Yeah, they're receiving it. It's there. Okay? But to suggest that no one is doing this is, 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 is not correct. And who would be the person? Could it be the parent company of Anna? Might be. Probably not. Okay? But they're not in this case. But look, there it is right there. This is at Real Water. They, they purchased this. They have the conditioning kit. And you saw Blaine Jones use it and say, here's, like, here's how I do it. I take this one. And I swirl the probe in this glass full of the conditioning kit, and I take it out, take off the access, then I take up another glass, and I put the other one in there, swirl it around for five minutes, he says. Then I take it out. So he's oxidizing it, using, the, using this right here. And they have this at Henderson. So they just oxidized it. I don't know... See, what you're saying is just as Chair says, look, Europe, you, 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 there's a European press manufacturer. And they didn't update the U.S. stuff. Well, that's wrong. Here's, here's the proof right here. Here's the instructions. It's been updated at, all the way up to Mars of 2021. So that doesn't satisfy the Wyatt case. Then we have the countryside. This is the stuff that's being used right here. In, in 2020, 2021. And, and Casey Akins, the guy, says, did you, ever, did you ever use these things? No, he's ever trained. Who did that? Well, that would be Blaine Jones. Did Blaine Jones just show me a video how to use that? Yes, he did. So Blaine Jones don't have to use this. You saw it clearly on the video. Do I know how to use this and oxidize? Yep, right here. He actually showed us on the video he knows how to do this. Now, when you buy something, if you decide not to use it, I can't help you there. But I shouldn't be punitively liable for giving you something that oxidizes it, right? When you own it, you own the oxidizing kit. It actually is there. I, 
I don't know what to, to do other than say, look, this thing is up, updated almost annually. But Hannah Instruments, Inc., a Rhode Island corporation, is not the party responsible for doing the updates. But they do them, and they update it all the time. And they updated it to make sure that it was compliance with all sorts of directives that were being in compliance with everything that goes on in the United States and so on. They are certified CE as opposed to UL. UL is just one for the United States. But it's not the, it's not the United States only testing laboratories and stuff like that. There's, there's, there's other competent ones that are out there besides UL. In this case, this European product is done by CE. That's, but that's new in this manual. And then all the different parts are in there. Disposal, disposal. How you treat it, after use. What you do to get it, to get it going. And then it gives you the optional accessories. Electrode rinse solution. Electrode storage solution. Platinum orb electrode with one millimeter cable. All, all these things are in the, the manual. All of the instructions. Always with the electrode pro protective cap before taking any measurement. Electrode has been left dry, soaked the tip storage solution for a few minutes to reactivate it. The meter is supplied complete with a nine volt battery. Then the o cream meter to this. Immerse the tip. Turn the instrument on by press. All this stuff is in there and is updated annually. I don't know where, where we get to this because they're using the, the very solution right there in 2020. So tell me, what is this? I mean, <clears throat> what is the ORP new probe conditioning instructions? What does it say, and how is it different? Hold that up a little bit. So, yeah, but, uh, so here you go. So in 2020, 2017, back to 2014, we manufacture the stuff. We sell it to, or they, they buy it from Milwaukee, okay? Meaning real water buys it from Milwaukee. It's ORP new probe conditioning instructions. So I just bought one. I just bought an ORP uh, meter. What do I do? To be conditioned before being put into use, and this should be, be done about every 30 days to ensure accurate of your, accuracy of your unit. Okay, so use this kit. Did we see Blaine Jones do this? Yes. Right on, right on the video. Procedure is as follows. Do this. I don't want to go through this and read the whole thing, but this is what you do. You put it in there, contents of the bottle, oxygen is another small glass container, place the probe in there, and then you see Blaine Jones do it. He literally follows this. And in fact, he says on the video, follow this. Do this. Read the instructions. He says that on the video. Place the probe and reduce the solution. Stir the probe and reduce the solution for at least six minutes. He says five minutes. Okay? Not going to hurt it for going longer. Remove and rinse the probe, bottle of water, bottle of drinking water, or RO water, wipe off excess rinse, and place the probe in the oxide solution. Stir that for five minutes. Remove and rinse the probe, bottle, bottle of drinking water, or RO water. Wipe up excess rinse and repeat the entire process again. So you do it a couple cycles. Several cycles, you see it may be necessary for negative readings. He tells you with this, hey, when do you want to do negative, this is what you need to do. Okay? He does it. Okay? Save the solution for additional applications later. Store conditioned probes in white distilled vinegar in case Aiken testifies. That's what we did. What did you store in it, Mr. Aiken? White distilled vinegar. So, in other words, when you're not using it, when you're not oxidizing it, if you're just going to store it off the site, which you leave in, white distilled vinegar. So he literally followed the instructions. We actually watched him do this on the video. And he has this. And he has it in 2020. Here's, uh, here's my next question, because I don't know the answer to this, but uh, <clears throat> they're taking a position to effective, I'm sorry, that apparently uh, this warning oh, or right. instruction, we'll call it instruction okay. for now, to keep it neutral. So, yeah. To effectively read a negative warp state of water, the platinum probes used in most orb meters must be in an unnatural condition, which is oxidized. Is that oxidation right here? I mean, where, 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 where do I see that? All orbs should be conditioned before being put into use, and this should be done as follows. Here's as follows. This kit contains two bottles of maintenance solution, reducing solution, and oxidizing solution. Blow it back out. Mr. Mark, ORP oxidation solution. That's what bottle number two is. It's literally the oxidation. Right there. There's a reduced 
producing solution and an oxidation solution. And this is Blaine Jones did this on the video. He took two different glasses. He put this the first bottle in or first container in one, then did it literally oxidize them right in front of you. Right, I understand, I think. Okay, so now for punitives, Mr. Kemp said, hey, you, you didn't you didn't give him these instructions, it was right there. And and if you want, and, and what is this? Real water has this. Real water has this. They're doing this. They literally showed you on a video, here's how you do it. And they did that. Okay? Following these instructions, which he then tells people you need to follow this. That's Blake Jones. A real water saying this is what you need to do, and they do that. I, I don't know how to be more clear. And this is this is not a million years ago, 35 years ago. And there's nothing wrong with having now, Mr. Let's say that Mr. Kemp is right that this thing is somehow cancer causing. The plaintiff's claims here are not that these cause cancer. I believe it's for acute liver injury. Very important, Your Honor, for punitive sakes, our, our instrument doesn't go into a five-gallon jug of water, okay, that's been oxidized, and then that jug of water is given to a consumer. That five-gallon jug is, and I've told you this, it gets flushed right down the, the sewer line right there. So our probe, that's been oxidized, Never comes in contact with any of the consumers. Okay? We can't go to, this is a dangerous probe because if people drink water that this has been, has been oxidized, that can be a problem. This is my next question. Do we have that printed out somewhere or a copy of that warning or whatever the insert is? We do. Do you want me to get that for you? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see it, and I want to make sure what's going on as far as specifically orb new probe conditioning. And is this the, is this the, is this the is this the prior conditioning? I mean, I want to make sure I understand what's there's going there's on. There's only one conditioning solution, Your Honor. This is the one that was used from 2012 to 2017. Okay. And and they still are using it. We find it at the Henderson plant in 2020. Finding an old bottle that's brown instead of clear. Uh, yes, you did find an old bottle in 2020, but go ahead. They know the instructions right here on how to do that. Yes, we, we can get you a copy of that. Remember, we were, let me explain what happened in March. Oh, that's okay. that's okay. You don't have to explain anything. I just wanted to see it. So, I, I guess, I guess, tell me, is this, this the position you're taking? I said, look, Judge, even though, hypothetically, 2018, 2019, um, no, 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 I, I, I'm going to complete it first, and then you can respond. I'm sorry. Yeah. Shut up. Um, you're right. <clears throat> let me look at my outline again. Hannah, stop, at some point, stopped including, because they no longer sold the conditioning, uh, the literature as it pertained to the, condi the uh, conditioning kit, notwithstanding that fact that at the time around this event occurred, uh, the fact that they had the kit in their possession it's uh, somehow obviate the necessity to issue a warning, something like that. I just want to make sure. It, it's, In it's, essence, they've already been warned. That's what you're saying. Yeah, and they're actually using it. They're, they've been warned. There's nothing in here that talks about cancer. This is not a cancer case. Is that fair? This is how you just oxidize a probe or be new probe condition instructions. They follow that. You see on the video, Blaine Jones actually doing that. I have just one more question from the clarity because I'll look at that. Is does it matter? It says here to effectively read a negative warp state of water. The platinum probes used in most warp meters must be in an unnatural condition, which is oxidized. Okay. So 
what you're oxidizing is that platinum tip. Okay. This is a chemistry answer to this one, and that is uh, it comes in a storage solution okay, that has salts on it. And I guess in a natural state, I guess if I was mining for it, it's going to have other things around it. But we do this in order to get rid of anything that could be there. Wipe off the exit, we're trying to get rid of it, and then we oxidize it to make sure that all that stuff that could inhibit it from being able to read quickly, this is what gets done. Okay? And we see Blaine Jones use this when he does the video correctly. And then we have him have this, and his sales staff continues to use it. And we, there's no reason why this doesn't have to be used all the way until 2020. And remember what it says right here. It's not like you go through this, you Can save the solution. That picture of that. I'll, I'll get you a copy. Well, I, I just asked Tori, can she copy? Save that? screen. Can you? All right, but continue on. No, oh, I, I think I've answered Mr. The, the legal questions that were somehow being suggested is that somehow we were shirking our responsibility. I had to shirk the responsibility of updating the manual. It, it's being mad. Your Honor, I can approach, I can just show you the right here on the back. Let's make sure you ask Mr. Kemp, can you, before can you show that? Right. Sorry, Thank Will, you. that was my fault. There's an REV down there at the bottom and it has a date. 321? Yeah. This thing's revised all the time. You can take a look and make sure I got it right. right. Sure, Mr. Okay. okay. We only got nine minutes before we're done today. Exactly. Okay. And I just want to make sure when I look at this, this is the new probe conditioning instructions that were contained with the conditioning. Okay, yeah, go ahead and back, back out, Mark. There's another... Yeah. So this is this is this is what you get. There's the kit. There's the two bottles. There's the instructions. How do I use this? All there. One last question. As far as the um, discovery, what did discovery disclose as far as what they were doing? As far as this stuff. Yes. So the video that you saw was Blaine Jones using this kit. That's what we found on the web. There's a YouTube video of Blaine Jones actually using this kit correctly. Put this, take, take bottle number one, put it into a glass, put in the probe, swirl it around, okay? Here you go, sir. Thank you. My, my question is this, what, were, what was going on as far as the, um, uh, what's the best way to say it, the technician or the employee who was performing this function? None of them. None of them were using the kit, Your Honor. Mr. Bush, the production manager, testified he wasn't using the kit. Mr. Mendega, who did the retail bottles, testified he wasn't using the kit. And Mr. Akins didn't know anything about the kit. The only evidence of anybody knowing anything about the kit is the Jones video in 2014. Okay. And that's probably why that you have an outdated bottle there because you can't even buy the kit after 2017. We'll, we'll, well, let's assume that's true. They've still got it in 2020. No, they still had it in the plant in 2020, Your Honor, sitting in a in a drawer. Okay. Lane Jones has the kit. Lane Jones shows us how to use the, the kit. Lane Jones uses the kit on the video and, and does what the instructions pursuant to the kit to how to oxidize the probe. Does all of those things. Okay. Then, and that was in 2014? I don't know. It was 12, 13, or 14. It's, it's yeah, that's, somewhere that's, in that range. I'll work with, with that for, for, for this discussion. Say 2012 to 2014. He does a video. Right. That you've seen. We, we showed that the plaintiffs had it up yesterday. I want to say two days ago. I thought you had it up. I think you showed it, actually. But that's okay. okay. Well, what about we we, we okay. wanted to have a good minute, remember? Right. And he shows 
I have the instructions and here they are and I'm doing them. Now, he's the vice president. Mr. Kemp could be right or wrong with regard to the technicians. I agree with Mr. Akins. Uh, I don't know about Anthony Brown, but whether or not Mr. Jones decides to tell the technicians how to oxidize new probes, when he already has the instructions and has shown on a video how to do this, that then becomes Mr. Jones's obligation to teach his own people how to do this. He knows how to do it. He did it on a video. The instruction says five minutes, Your Honor. Well, well, well the thing, I'm, I'm going to look at this. And, uh, but I mean, as far as, I don't think there's a, um, you can delegate the, the obligation to potentially give warnings to someone who has something in their possession. I just want to make sure I understand the timeline. I want to make sure I understand specifically what this warning is. No, I, let me just say this. I'm not delegating that to the technicians. I'm saying if you decide, if you and I are in business together and you say, Scott, I don't want you to ever condition these probes. Scott, you could do something else. Okay, that's fine. Judge, that, that means that's okay. Right? I don't have to tell technicians to go condition probes. I may not want them to do that. I may not, I may not have them do that. He did a training video, though, on how to do this. Whether or not that equated down to other people to do that, this now becomes something that's certainly not punitive in nature to me when I'm giving you instructions on how to do it right there. And then Blaine Jones does them correctly. I'm not saying that I can't delegate to the technicians, but if the technicians are told, don't do this, I, I can't get into it. We're putting on a, a step almost where you're saying, oh, Hannah needs to be over there telling them how to do this. No, I'm not, I'm not saying Hannah has to do that because at the end of the day, the thrust and focus is on the adequacy of the warning that accompanies the product. Right. There's, I mean, a, there's the instruction. I understand. And they did that. And remember what the result was? They had Aquafina, it was one color, they added the concentrate, they put the probe in, and the probe went up after oxidation. After they did this, then it worked. Just the way they wanted it to. So, I don't... Was it adequate? Well, according to the video, it was exactly what they wanted. We don't disagree. So, how can I be punitively liable? So, they, they had, they did, they showed how to do it, they made a training video to do it, and then they said, you want to hear, no, you're, 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 it wasn't revised. Well, we showed you it was revised. Well, this wasn't adequate. But they literally showed us on the video how to do it. <laughs> they had the instructions on how to do it. And then they did it. And they did it right. I'm no, no, I'm just... Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Judge, I found the two deposition sites I was referring to. Can I show them briefly to the court? You can. Let me have the first one, Chris. These? No, no, I just. Aren't these already exhibits in, in evidence? Somewhere they are, Your Honor. Yes, they are somewhere, Your Honor. But do, do you want me to. No, no, no. If they're in evidence, I, I think Tori's more concerned about protocol. She just wants they, to are, they are exhibits that we have already provided in electronic form to as a part of our exhibits in this case. Okay. Right. This is Mr. Petrayan again. He's the general manager of Hunnery. And so we're asking where the user manual came from. He says it's prepared a long time ago with small modifications, aesthetic modifications. And then uh, when was the manual written? 80s or 90s? I say 35 years. You, know, you could argue 40, you could argue 30. Uh, who wrote it? And then here. Okay. And they used the same manual since 2000, except for aesthetics. Yes, I think so, yes. So that is what I'm relying upon for the proposition that the manual hasn't been changed every year like Mr. Uh, Rasmussen contends. And I point out I haven't been given, you know, the annual changes of these manuals in discovery, which if it has been changed over the years, I should have been given it. Second point, the toxicity, Chris. Uh, that that it's, European Union is toxic. Ted, Ted, did you I got it. Okay, let me just read it. Okay. Is it Patrice? Here it is. 
It's small, Your Honor, but it's too small. I'm going to give the bait the numbers so the court. You have younger eyes than Mr. Kent, I think. Way it's younger. younger. It's a little younger. So the bait numbers I'm looking at, Your Honor, are MILW0048814881. And 4883. The first email, December 7, 2017. This is from Milwaukee to Jeffrey Desitel over at Real Water. Jeffrey, the SE300 Electro needs to be stored all the time in a cup or a jar of white distilled vinegar. I'm not speaking of that uh, solution or two bottles of solution in this area. Matthew's earlier. By using a cup or jar about one half full, and when it gets cloudy, just pour out and replace with fresh vinegar, 2.5 pH, and will oxidize the nitro. In that way, it's a good sanitizing and cleaning agent. And this is what Mr. Kemp was speaking of that follows on this, this same page. It's from Mr. Jeffrey Desitel to Milwaukee. Hi, Brian, and thank you for the information about solution number two. If there's any way we can get solution number one, if not when using the vinegar, do we just rinse and repeat the vinegar? Here's the response, Your Honor. And this is again to Jeffrey from Milwaukee. The MA9025 kit is no longer available because the CE European governing body has ruled that solution number two in the kit is toxic. So we can't sell the kit any longer. The U.S. EPA does not have a problem with chemical 2 in the kit, but the kit is produced in Europe, so we no longer have it available. So this is so close to the Wyatt case, and that's what Mr. Kent was trying to describe to the court earlier. And so that's again, Your Honor, MILW004881 and 4882. And the final email, again, is from the General Sales Manager in Milwaukee. The kit was designed to speed up the oxidation process of the SE300 or electrode to reduce the super negative numbers in user can still use, get the same result using white distilled vinegar. It requires longer conditioning time and proper storage. So I think that dispels the, uh, the comments Mr. Rasmussen making earlier about what the State of the Union was in 2017 in terms of what was being used to oxidize those probes. And it further supports uh, Justice Cherry's, uh, or is similar to Justice Cherry's decision in the White case. I appreciate Mr. Parker's thoughts, but the reality is, is that real water said with regard to any of the water that this probe that touched, that water was never used by the consumers. It would, did not go out to consumers. Thus, any safety that needed to be done was followed because it never went there. You can use toxic chemicals all the time to do things so long as you get rid of them, which they did here. They literally flushed this water down the drain. So I appreciate that stretch. But that can't be it. We're past time. All right. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'll have a decision before we start tomorrow, 1030. Thank you. Thank you. 1030 tomorrow, yeah? 1030, uh, Tori, is that correct? All right. All right.